Right, so this part is the setting out of the window. So I'm just going to separate uh, the different components. So we've got a head and a sill, and then we've got three uprights, so a mullion and uh, two jams either side of the window. So I'm just going to focus for a start on the horizontal section, so the head and the sill, um, and they're the sections that will have the mortises in them. So we'll take each piece and uh, just thoroughly check over it and uh, pencil in any imperfections that I can see uh, looking at each face and all the corners um, sort of combined. And we can get a good flavour for, uh, for any imperfections in the timber and where we want to put them or where it's going to be best to put them to either hide them or to chop them out in their rebate. So we've done a pretty good job of planing that up. There's not an awful lot of um, nastiness hiding in there. There's a bit of dark staining in the grain. You sometimes get that with oak. Um, that should come out with, with the finish. Uh, it should be highlighted too badly. Um, so there's not really any, any massive imperfections. The hard ones to spot when you're setting out are like a shake. So I'll show you if, I, if there is one in this timber. I've not seen one yet, but generally a shake, um, or what you'd normally call a shake, would be in the centre of a timber, and it's just where the grain will separate across um, across the timber, but within usually within the casing of the of what it's been dried as. So this was dried as as a double piece, so a wider piece, and I've cut it down. So you'd probably see a shake come out in the middle of this piece of timber. And they can um, sort of splay across from the from the corners, um, and it looks like it's attached, but you'll have a, a line on it like this, um, and they're quite nasty. Uh, as soon as you put a machine into them to rebate it or anything like that, um, they tend to split away and then show up, show themselves up. So, if you can find them in the timber, if there is any, mark them out, and we'll try and disguise them on sort of the back or the edge of the timber where nothing's going to. No, be seen. It'll be in either the brickwork or in the plaster work. So um, that's the best way to deal with them. And equally, if you've got some pieces with shakes and some pieces without, um, we can put the ones without the better pieces in the centre of the window where you see all four edges of it, um, and it just makes for a better job. So really pay attention. Like I say, mark all the pieces. Um, and then when you've got that, you can orientate the piece of timber to suit um, the position in the window. So we'll go back to the cross-section drawing. We're going to use this piece as we use as the head of the sill. Let's use this one as the sill. So we're looking at a sill here. Um, let's fold that in half because we're not using that bit. I'm going to add a piece of timber on my sills like this um, underneath a half inch strip of timber just to make that 58 mil timber um, a bit taller so it gives the appearance of a three inch sill so in the sill the options for hiding any any imperfections um, we've got a rebate here with a bevel on it as well so we've got a fair bit of material removal from that section of the uh, timber there and then pretty much to the halfway point on the piece of timber on the front face we're not going to see any of that because we've got a sub sill covering it we're not going to see anything underneath because it's in the brickwork or whatever's underneath the window and then on this back edge um, from that bottom point there uh, where it sits on the brickwork it depends on the on the build and what they're doing but generally you've got about 25 mil from that point there up the uh, inside edge of the window um, between them two points will be covered by a window board. So on this particular sill that's not an awful lot of timber because we've got half inch of that is uh, extra strip so we've got about half an inch on that back edge of the timber. So we've got a bit of scope there to hide something on the corner for up to half an inch. We've got a load to rebate out the front and uh, we don't see much of that bottom corner, so we can hide some imperfections there. 
What we want to make sure then, basically, is that this face and the inside face there are really nice and clean and they're the best edges on the timber and that nothing too drastic, no shakes are on this edge here where this rebate's seen because that's the most important point on, on cutting into the timber. You don't want a shake or a split on this rebate here. And then we can get rid of some infections in the sill and on that front face. So I'll have a look at this bit of timber. So ends are both pretty clean. We're looking at a nice bit of wood. Um, a little bit of yellow and black staining in it, um, but that's just a character of oak sometimes. We've got a mark somewhere here, so we've got a bit of a bit of a shake in the timber here. I don't know if you can pick that up. Um, just here. That was penciled in. So in terms of getting rid of that, um, the potential for getting rid of that is we could either rebate it out with that uh, 15 by 65 rebate and have the timber this way up. So that would be the rebate to get rid of it to there. And then this would be our scene edge. Or we could face it towards us inside. So that was the bottom edge of the window on the inside. And that's where the window board would sit up to. So that would hide it as well. But in terms of orientating it, that's not too much of a problem. I'm going to look for which edge is the best to go on the inside of the window. I quite like this face for the inside. Um, and that edge isn't too bad. Let's have a look, see if anything's better. That edge is probably a better edge. So I'm going to go with, uh, with this face for the inside. And that imperfection is going to be hidden by the window board on the inside edge. So. Now that I've decided that, what we're calling a face on the window um, in terms of the, the drawing here, cross-section drawing. So this edge here, so this face part here is the face. And I'm going to call this part here, of the timber, so the long side, the edge. So you always mark the face and edge. And they always depict the sort of the scene internal points of the window so the bits that you're working from to create the joints and it you know it's a reference face you always work from a face and an edge so that's your reference points so the face again inside edge inside edge so let's put that onto this piece of wood so we know exactly where it's going to sit in the window face mark will look like this so it's basically like a, a squiggly line Everyone does it slightly different, but that's just a, a general face mark. So to do it quickly, you just yeah squiggle, and the line goes off, and that line points to the edge. So then your edge is an arrow like this. So it's just a pointed arrow that points to your edge. So if you've got square timber, there's a difference between face and edge, and you know which is which. So we know exactly now where that piece of timber, face, edge, I could draw if I wanted to, or I know in my mind's eye exactly how that piece of timber is going to be. It's going to be exactly like that on the drawing. Can't hold that. So we've got a rebate here with a bevel, sill point, and uh, that's pretty much it. We'll have a piece added on here and a sub sill. So, from them face marks, we can identify exactly what that is. So I'm going to write on it now, sill as well, because um, there's a head and a sill to each window. Same principle with the head. Um, look for any imperfections. Sometimes best to just don't touch the edges, but carefully run your hands along, you can feel imperfections more sometimes than you can see them. Um, if you sit there set, setting out for a long time, you sort of go a bit blind to an imperfection. And uh, when you cut into it and it blows a bit out with a split, you think, well, how did I not see that? So um, yeah, sometimes it's just good to, to feel um, if there's any splits or anything sticking up rather than trying to see them. So we'll go this way. So face, 
an edge. So you can tell me now which way around that timber's gonna go. Can't see it on the screen. Got a mark there and a mark there. You should know exactly what that means. So inside face of the window, edge that points inside of the window. So again, um, we could draw that on the end grain without particularly looking at a drawing or anything. I know there's gonna be a rebate there. Um, and that's how the timber is going to be orientated for a head. So we'll write head on that because it's the head of the window. And we know what each of them two pieces are for. Now, some people will set this out um, edge to edge like this, but I prefer to so that the two edges point together and you can draw them in a cross like that and you can then realign them crosses and you know which two bits have been drawn together. But generally I'll um, you know, either number them or write on what they are um, as you do them together um, or just have one as a pattern if there's loads the same and always work from that pattern piece so it doesn't matter which two bits you pick up you're going to get uh, a very very close match on the two pieces and it's not going to matter which one's which. But uh, head and the sill you want to put them two face marks so that they sit together like that so that they point to each other. That's really important that you always work with two faces or two edges pointing to each other. Um, if they were the other way around and uh, your window's not a symmetrical thing, so it's not the same both sides, or you're doing making a door frame or something, you know, a door or a casement with a bigger bottom rail than a top rail. If you don't have the two edge marks pointing to each other, you're going to end up with two identical styles and not a pair. Um, and that's quite a common sort of pitfall for an apprentice to, uh, to end up with a couple of styles. Um, that aren't a pair, so they're two exactly the same styles and it doesn't work, you can't glue them up, so it either becomes a bit of a bodge or you're starting again for one of them styles. So make sure they're together in a pair and then we'll clamp them together. So now they're clamped together, I'm just going to move the camera onto the bench so you can see the setting out process. Okay, so for setting out, we're going to want a nice sharp uh, pencil. I use a mechanical sharpener to get a really nice point on the pencil. Um, it's a 3H and it's a Stabilo Othello 282 um, and these are about the best ones I've come across and I've tried quite a few, uh, tried all the Stabilas and uh, all sorts but uh, these seem to, to last the course, don't break and hold a nice edge so uh, fully recommend them. So in terms of setting out the head and the sill we've got a window that is 1250 wide. So we'll have a look at what timber length we've got. So I've added 20 mil on, I've got 1270 in my bits of wood. So you can orientate the window wherever you want on them pieces as long as you can get that uh, 1250 out of it. If you've got a, an imperfection one end then push the window towards the other end of the material. Um, I'm fine with these bits of wood so I'm just going to have a 10mm overhang each end. So I'm going to start with the 10mm mark on this end of the tape, nice and accurate, and then move down and mark 1260 on this other end, so it's 1250 plus the 10 I've already put on. So that's the outside dimensions of the window marked. Next we'll move on to setting out the two jams. Okay, so my mark here is for the uh, edge of the window. Now you can either use a physical section of window to mark out the next point, which I know some joiners like to do. So you, you push your timber up to that tick point, just slightly past it, and then gently tick the timber where the uh, thickness of it comes to. I don't tend to, tend to use that method. I prefer to have a, a real fine tape measure right on the centre of the line and mark the, the thickness that I've got. Um, I'm pretty accurate with my thicknessing and uh, it's all set up nice and square and, and perfect so working from a, an accurate tape measure is 
I find more accurate for setting out like this than using lines off of a bit of timber. So 58mm is the width of our jams, so we've marked that on. And because we're putting the mortise in the actual rebate, we need to add a setback on. So from the inside of that uh, mark at 58mm, so the inside edge of the window, we're going to mark back into the timber 15mm. So we end up with three marks like this, one, two, three on the piece of timber um, and they are at, so if we work from 100mm on the outside of the window, we've got one at uh, 43 and one at 58mm. So we'll just uh, square them over, the two pieces or however many you want in this, uh, this particular size window, we'll square them over like so. Nice fine lines, we don't want uh, real thick heavy lines, we just want a nice, nice fine line, just enough so that you can see it. So that's one side done, we'll do the same on the other side. So from that outside mark, okay, 58 millimetres and 43. And we'll square them over. Like so. So that leaves us with the positions of our mortises um, on the timber itself. Okay, so to set out the middle pieces of timber, we're going to want to uh, measure the inside gap between the them, them outer pieces of timber. We want to measure the gap that's left between the insides of them. So from that 58 mil line that we've marked in on both sides, measure between them. So setting the tape on the 100 mil there, I've got uh, 1234, so I'll knock the 100 mil off. Um, measuring from 100 mil onto the line um, is more accurate than using the end of the tape to guess where the line is. You can stick it on 100 mil and then measure from there. You just really need to remember to take that off if you are measuring from 100. Um, and it'll be a very common mistake. You'll see a lot of windows and doors made um, either 100 mil too short generally, but sometimes 100 mil too big. Um, so 11.34, I'll do this on a bit of paper really. 11.34 is the gap between them two outside edges. Um, we've got a 58 mil piece of timber, so we'll take that away from the 11.34. Um, we've got six, and we've got uh, seven. So we've got 1,076, and we want to divide that by two. So we've got 5.38. So from them inside lines, we'll measure 5.38. Again, from the 100 mil, I'm working to 6.38. Always measure from both ends, don't just mark from one end, then the thickness of the wood. Or if you do that, make sure you check it, so it's dead easy to, to come a cropper on anything like this, especially if you're doing four or five, six sections, um, and you forget to add one in, um, you can come a cropper like I say. So there you go, 58 mil piece of timber dead in the center. We'll uh, square them lines over, like so. And that's the position of our mullion. And then we'll, like the outside edges, we'll bring that mortise in 15 mil because of the uh, the mortise being in the rebate and it cutting away at the mortise as you machine it um, it reduces it every time that you have a rebate so this has got one on both sides of the piece of timber so we need to come in 15 mil from both edges 
and again we'll just square them lines over. Now in terms of setting out for this window, um, that's pretty much it for positions of the mortises. Um, you could mark out your trickle vent uh, section here and now. I usually leave that until I've uh, got further down the line with the project. So I'll unclamp these. Then take each piece of timber and working just on the edge, because I, I don't like to mortise right through my windows, I used to, but I've now changed to just uh, just uh, a stub tenon and a single mortise from one side. Um, I will transfer them lines onto that edge mark face, so the inside edge. You don't need to uh, bring all four lines across, all that you need to bring across are the two inner lines. Um, but I just generally, out of habit, tend to bring all four lines round on a frame. Um, it's nice to see the position of it sometimes, especially if you're hand cutting the, uh, if you're doing a hand scribed moulding on a frame. It's nice to have that nice square reference point as to where um, you need to mitre to or something like that. So it's just a habit thing really. But all, all the lines we need for in terms of mortising are these two lines here. See what, for the end edges I'll just transfer over the mortise lines so you can see that I don't need them extra lines. When you're using a square, um, it's just pressure against against the brass section here. Make sure it's nice and clean. You can check if it's square. Um, you want a perfectly flat surface, um, but you can check it on and just do a, a gentle line at ideally full length of the square. Turn it over and just check that line in the other orientation and see if they match up. Um, might need a little bit of adjustment if they don't match up. So you want to just make sure that a square it is nice and square, um, especially if you've got really deep sections of timber. Do the same on the sill. And they will be our mortise positions. So if we look at the cross section of the sill in this drawing here, uh, the mortise position you've heard me talking about is in the rebate, so it will be a 16mm mortise from this edge here, so 16mm to approximately here on the drawing. So that's where the mortise is going. Now in terms of getting your head around what a setback is and where the setback comes in, um, obviously the, the mortise is, is this position here. Um, so where that rebate is, you're chiselling away or cutting away that material in that section. So if that was the vertical piece of timber, um, you're physically cutting away at where that mortise is. So the mortise is no longer the full width of the timber, it's less the amount that you're cutting away. So in this case it's 15mm. Um, and that's why we've got them setbacks in there, that's why we've moved in 15mm so that when them jams and mullion go into the frame, they've been chopped away that 15mm either side and uh, it will fit nice and tightly in that mortise that's left. So we can set out exactly where our mortise is going now um, on the piece of timber and set up a mortise gauge. Um, for this method of cutting the mortises, you don't really need a mortise gauge. Um, it's just a handy reference to have for a start, um, but not necessary at all. If you set it out on your pattern piece and adjust your machine to suit, then there's not really too much of a need for a mortise gauge. A mortise gauge is ideal um, for a traditional sort of build. If you're cutting by hand, you'd be marking out every single piece using the gauge to give you them lines to cut to. So. Um, whereas with sort of machining a window and setting up a machine, you only need to get that machine in the right place once and then you're uh, 
repeating it on all the parts. So uh, a gauge isn't particularly useful in this scenario. Um, the only time it's handy in modern joinery, I find, is if you've got a really deep rail and you're putting a, a tenon into that rail on the top edge and your mortise or fence or something isn't very tall um, and you're adjusting the height of the mortiser, you might just want a reference on there using a gauge to make sure your mortise is in the right position um, and is not being thrown out by a bow in the timber or something. So a gauge isn't really necessary, but it's, uh, it's a good, good practice to have one set up. So we've got a 64 mil rebate, um, 64 or 65, I'm gonna to stick to 64 with these. And then uh, we've got a 16 mil tenon. So I've just put a light pencil line on there at 64 mil, and then I'm gonna come back in uh, 16 mil. There my uh, rough tenon position. So you can, at this type of mortise gauge, you can wind the, uh, the second pin to suit the chisel on the mortiser so that the centre points are exactly the outside dimension of the, chi of the mortise chisel or 16mm, whichever way you prefer. That's not a bad guess. Then we can set it to suit them lines. So um, this back pin will be 64 mil in. Again, we're working from the face. So that reference face, um, it's 64 mil from the back edge. So whatever that is from the face, we put in that uh, that inside pin. Am I there? Tightened it up. Um, and then just mark your, your lines ready for your mortise there. So that, that's the rough position of the mortise. I'm not gonna to go too much by the gauge, but we've got one set up for a nice reference. And just double check that. Might be slightly more, it's 64 and a half, but like I say, 64 to 65 mil is about perfect for the rebate depth. Just alter him a touch. Okay. Don't go out of the lines here with the gauge. So if you if you gauge this point of the timber here um, and you don't quite cut it with the rebate, you'll see a nasty gouge line and it will really show up in the stain. So stay within the lines and you can just run a pencil in if you like um, to highlight the two edges of the line so that you can see the center nice and sharply. 64mm. Right, we'll put the seals to one side for now. Um, I like to machine the tenons first and then the seals with the mortises second. Okay, so moving on to the uprights. So we've got a mullion and two jams. Again, it's the same process when we first get our hands on the timber after planing. Before we do any setting out, we're going to look for any imperfections. So already we've got one on the edge here. That stretches to sort of them dimensions and just in there. So that's my imperfection just there. That will come out in a rebate. It could be hidden by the plaster line um, or anything like that. So that's not too serious. Let's keep moving around. Um, nothing there. You perhaps pick up on something like a knot like that. And if you can see that, there we go. Um, perhaps pick up on a knot like that if it's, um, you can tell by your eye where it's roughly going to be. If that's going to be right on the edge of your of your rebate, um, you might just, just change your orientation to alter that because uh, it's potentially going to chip a little bit out and against a black draft seal, um, you don't want a, a chipped bit of wood, it's just going to show up and look a bit rough. So. Um, try and avoid that at this stage if you can, if you've got the option to. Nice clean edges here um, and no problems other than that. So um, yeah, we can rebate that, uh, that dent out from a forklift or something where the timber's been knocked. 
and uh, use this as the outside edge. Let's check the ends. That's pretty, really nice bit of work that. So, um, got a face there and an edge, and I'll just keep in my memory that that piece is good on all four edges and could be used as a mullion. Check this one, that face is good. That one's pretty good. Planing's not quite so nice on there. That's good. Oh, that's perfect. So the planing's a bit nicer finish on this edge than it is on this edge. Um, a bit of, bit of grain raised there on that side. So I'll keep that against the wall. And I'll put, uh, this is a really nice bit of figuring in here, quarter sawn fleck. Um, I'm going to put this side as my face, so that's the inside, remember, and um, edge with the arrow to the inside edge of the window. So that piece is, is currently winning to be uh, the centre piece. Have a look at this final bit. That's quite nice. I mean, there's a bit of a difference in the grain here. Um, you see it's got like a bit of a white patch in the centre and darker at the edges. Um, probably tempted to uh, not see that so much. So pretty good along all of this edge. So that's lending itself more to an inside and that more to an outside. Um, let's have a look at this knot here, see if it will go with a rebate. So rebate's going to come to there. Risk, that's risky to say that that will go in a rebate because it looks like the knot is disappearing in a diagonal. So you're going to see that if you rebate, um, still have a knot problem there. Um, not the end of the world because it's not a bad knot, but uh, we'll perhaps hide that um, against the plaster work in a second. Other than that, this edge is really nice, nice and clean. That's got a lovely bit of figure in there. So I think the perfect orientation for this one is to get that sort of discoloured part to the outside. We'll hide this knot against the plaster work. We'll keep this as the nice inside face. It's got the best figuring on the grain. And that, that surface there where the draft seal will be, um, it's dead clean. So it's a nice rebate edge. So face mark for the inside of the window edge for the inside edge. We'll go back to that first one that we did and make that the, uh, the mullion. So we'll put an extra edge mark on that and that will mean it will get machined on both this face and this face because it's the best one of the three. The next job is to orientate them like they will be in the window. So they're going to look like that. So you've got two edges facing each other and the one in the middle. Now, if you're setting out and you've seen anything that might uh, make a difference to which end goes to the top and which goes to the bottom, then uh, you probably want to take a reference to that as well. Um, generally, <laughs> there's not going to be an awful lot that's going to make a difference to top and bottom. Um, other than if you've got a bigger mortise, maybe if you're doing a bigger tenon at the bottom, which we're not, then uh, you might lose a, an imperfection putting something more towards the bottom or the top, depending on which one was bigger. But uh, yeah, you could, could take note if it's going to make any difference, but on this job, it's not going to make an awful lot of difference. Um, so we're just going to mark a top on this window. So um, orientate it. So one end of each of these timbers when they're in the right uh, uh, pattern so you've got two faces matching each other and the middle one in the middle will mark a top at one end on all three so that way we've now got a pair so the two outside make a pair and a middle unit and when they go together in a window we know we've got one of each piece that's going to make make up the window you're not going to end up with two left hand jams and a center jam and not be able to put the the one in the right 
The reason that makes a difference is because we've got a different joint at the top of the window in the head to at the bottom of the window. So going back to our drawings, the sill has got a bevel which we need to add into the joint um, and the head is obviously just a square section. Probably under this one, yeah the head. Oh, that's not a head, that's a jam, but it's exactly the same. So the head there is just a square cut joint and the sill will have that nine degree bevel built into the joint. So it's gonna be different each end. Right, to set the height that I'm gonna cut them uprights off to, um, I'm gonna, just gonna lay out a rod drawing of the upright of the window. Now, you don't need to do this, but a drawing like this, if you're not sure entirely what you're doing, can be quite helpful. I'm just gonna use it to help explain how we get to the height of the uh, cut sections of wood we're gonna use for them pieces um, versus the overall height of the window. So I'm just gonna draw a line on here at 95 mil, the thickness of the wood, or the timber that we're using for the window, all the way up the board. Um, I'm just gonna use the end of the timber for the uh, top of the window. And then I'm gonna mark out full size that we're gonna be working to. So it's 1055, it's the height of our window. So that is our brickwork or finish height of our window. So let's draw, like we did on the sill, the sections of timber that we've got. So on the sill, where's our cross section so we can refer to it. Here. We've got uh, that 12 mil piece of timber, then the 58 mil section of wood to make up the sill. So let's draw them on. There'll be a 70 mil overall, 12 mil section there, and then 15 mil rebate. So I'm just going to lightly pencil these lines in. That one can be a bit stiffer. So there we have um, that section is the fillet of timber to make up the extra height. Um, and then we've got our 58 mil of sill. Um, for the rebate, so basically drawing what I've got in cross section there, but onto this uh, board to make up a cross section, full size rod drawing for reference on all my sizes. That way you sort of, you can't go wrong with cutting things to length because you've got it in full size in front of you. You're not working off of a cross section drawing um, and using measurements. It's as easy to, to add a wrong measurement into a calculator or get confused and take it away instead of adding and end up with a window that's too small. So just drawing out into full size might take you five minutes but you know you're going to cut everything to the right size. So that's our sill section there. With accuracy of the drawing I'll add on a bevel there to suit a 9mm bevel. Somewhere like there. So that's our sill section. We'll draw the head on as well. So again, 58 mil section size, 43 mil to the rebate. Draw them in lightly. Mark our rebate on, 65. And that's our timber section. So in order to get a stub tenon in there that provides enough security, um, stop it twisting and enough surface area to hold it together with the glue, generally I'm gonna go from the lowest point and add roughly 20 mil as a minimum onto that stub tenon. So as this is gonna lose a bit, um, where's my gauge? Good idea to show you the gauge point here. So the mortise is going there in the window. 
that's our mortise position, remember, we've set the gauge. Um, so from that point there, I'm going to want at least 20 mil. So I'm going to go a bit more and make the mass a bit more rounded. Um, so let's go so that we've got 40 mil. So it'll be a 40 mil deep tenon on the inside face and 25 mil on the square rebate face. So that's going to be our tenon height there. We'll do the same at the head. So a 40 mil tenon. Again, that's the end of our stub tenon, so the cut height. Can mark that on. So to get the length of our uprights that we're going to cut it to, I'm going to measure from this point here down to this point here. Again off the 100 mil and take it off our final value. So we've got 1107, 1107, and I'm going to take that 100 mil off, so it's 1007 millimetres. That's the cut height for this specific window, but the overall um, height is 1055. So if we're doing multiple windows using the same dimension timbers, we just need to work out the difference between the two. So 1055 minus 1007 uh, gives us 48 mil, I think. Yeah, 48 mil um, different. So if we take the height of any of the other windows, if they're exactly the same construction, head and sill sizes, all we've got to do is take that finish height window take 48 mil off and that is the cut height for the uprights in that window or the cut length so we can do them all off of that measurement there save that rod um, you can draw one of them for every window if you like not particularly necessary if you've done it once um, or you don't even need to do it if you're following this video to the absolute t to exactly what i do then you shouldn't need to to use the rod you just follow their measurements that I've given you. Okay so you want a really square saw so nice fixed fence nice sturdy bed and, and fixed saw so nothing can move um, and then get yourself some of your offcuts or your one of your pattern pieces that you've already got and uh, just do a couple of test cuts with it and make sure with an engineer's square that you're getting perfectly square cuts both in the front to back plane and in the vertical plane of that piece of timber as you cut it so um, it is dead square across that face so we're using that square cut to reference the tenons in this style um, because we're not using a tenoner so that needs to be deadly accurate to get accurate results in the joint. So once we've got that nice square cutting saw we'll trim one end up to, to square it up turn it round and then cut it to length. Right, so cut the ends of the uprights. Um, and I've also squared up the two ends of this piece of um, pattern piece. So it's a short piece to the same dimensions as the window. Like I said before, it could be any sort of thickness in width. It doesn't have to match the window, but it's nice if it does. So I've squared them up and uh, I'm just going to set out the two, uh, two joints we're going to cut on the frame. So the sill joint and the head joint. So that stub tenon depth was 40 mil, so I'm going to mark that 40 mil on initially. As per the uh, rod that we've drawn out. So that's the shoulder that will sit on the inside of the window at that cut line there. So we can square that one round. That's 
so that will be the inside of our pattern piece and it doesn't really matter which one's the edge. Um, that's the inside shoulder. So on the head we've just got a 15mm square shoulder, 15mm uh, deep rebate so it's a 15mm shoulder away from that uh, inside uh, edge and we'll mark that one on with a square as well and uh, we can draw our tenon position on with a um, either mark it on by hand with a, with a ruler um, or tape measure and scribe the lines over using a uh, combination square or if you've got a mortise gauge you can put them on with a mortise gauge generally I'll just put if I'm doing them on the tenon I normally just put a tick mark um, so I'll, I'll mark the position with a tick and work to that line on the tenon because you know everything's square but it's nice to have a gauge line um, if you're not using a tenon so run them gauge lines in so that is the shape of the tenon on the head of the window so we'll be cutting away this section here and this section here to perform that, uh, that tenon joint. So this is our 16mm tenon that will be left on. So we'll square them lines around so we've got reference on all faces of what our joint's going to look like. If you're going to set it out just on one face, I would do it with the face there and do it on this edge. So if you stand it up like that, the face is to the right and the setting out is on the front because we're going to be running this past a saw so the fence is here I'm going to run it into the saw blade like that so you want to see your marking out as we're running it in to set it up so, but generally it's nice to square everything around and uh, mark it all out on all faces if you don't know what you're doing so that you've got a good sort of visual reference of what's going on with the joint so I'll just run this gauge round don't be too fussy with your lines on a pattern piece um, in terms of keeping don't, not going beyond the lines because uh, it's just a pattern piece. So there's our tenon lines on the end grain and again on the other side. So we're taking away this material here on the inside of the piece of wood, that's the outside of the joint. Like that, so it's a nice simple square joint on a uh, on a window frame. So there's nothing too complicated about that. Okay, on the sill side, um, exactly the same setting out process. So I'm going to keep with my face here and work on that edge that's going to be appropriate on the saw. Um, 40 mil again from the end. This is why it's important to have perfectly square cut shoulders because you're working from edges and measuring if that was half a mil out of square across there you have a different joint on one to the other depending on which side you worked on so um, dead square timber is really important dead square cuts on the machines not only for accurate joints but when it comes to gluing it together you're going to end up with a square frame it's pretty difficult to glue perfectly square joints up nice and tight and get them out of square whereas if uh, if they're out of square for a start it's quite difficult to glue them up nice and square so it, it makes a difference all the way through the job so just square them lines around the same as the other side I've drawn a 15 mil set back on this joint again Exactly the same as the head. Um, I'll just describe these tenon position lines through with the mortise gauge. Mortise gauge is slightly trickier to use than a standard uh, marking gauge because you've got two pins that need to be touching the surface as well as this edge being perfectly parallel with the timber. So um, it's a lot of pressure on on the face of the gauge here to keep it square before it touches the timber and then you're just letting them pins engage and then 
keeping everything nice and parallel, not putting too much pressure into the pins, else it'll tend to follow the grain for a start. Just nice light lines and then build up a build up a mark into the timber until you've got two clear sort of sharp pin lines in your piece of wood and that's a, a nice accurate gauge there. So we'll just run them lines in so it's the same as the other joint. Like this. But on this one we're gonna have a nine degree bevel. So it's from this 65 mil. I usually have a little flat on that somewhere here, and then we'll be a nine degrees. 99, come on, can do it. So the cut on the sill is going to look like that. So square that line around. And again, we'll run a 99 degree line in from there. Like that. So that's our cut. So generally it's about 9 mil more from the square cut. So it's yeah, 10 mil there, 10 mil more on that shoulder at the point of the joint than it is on the head. So um, just gonna have to bear that in mind. If you're tenoning and got square blocks and doing this cut after, like I have to do, you have to set that tenon back square 10 mil further back than the other one so that you can cut this bevel afterwards. But that's uh, irrelevant for this, uh, for this project, so I probably shouldn't mention that. So that's our uh, cut joints there for the sill. So, sill, head. The reason I've marked both of them out, instead of just doing one, showing you how to cut it and then doing the other, is uh, the inside joint cuts can actually be done together because they're exactly the same. And the outside cut joints, um, the way we're going to tenon it on the circular saw is pretty much exactly the same. So we'll set it up so it cuts for the sill just slightly lower and then the um, crosscut saw will actually take out the last bit needed to uh, clear that uh, joint on the on the head section. So we'll set the circular saw for running the tenons up exactly the same for both the head and the sill. Um, so we'll just do one end, turn it around and then do the other.